Thanks for staying with us. Uh, it's still the breakfast on Plus TV Africa. Uh, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, has uh, expressed significant worry over the escalating global debt, which is projected to exceed $100 trillion by 2024. Despite a slight decline in debt levels in previous years, the trend is shifting upward again, raising alarm about sustainability. The IMF highlights the necessary, necessity for governments to adopt rigorous fiscal policies to manage and reduce public debt, especially in low-income developing countries that face heightened risks of debt distress. The organization urges policymakers to enhance revenue collection cap capabilities and implement effective fiscal frameworks to foster economic growth and create more fiscal space for investment. Our guest this morning is Mr. Shegun Shokwiton, Chairman Accountability, Kando, and Transparency Network. Good morning and welcome to the program, sir. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Okay. Let me start with something that is not related at all, but what we have just discussed in the previous segment before you came. As a CSO uh, person, uh, let me just ask you this. To X-ray, help us X-ray briefly, because that's not what we're discussing now. Briefly, with a statement of the president that you either take the 1,000 naira uh, f per liter of petrol or you take CNG, your choice. Uh, let's hear your take on that statement before we move on to the crux of the matter for today. Well, well I mean, it's, it's unfortunate because it, it shows that the man is, you know, um, uh, what's it called now, uh, stubbornly sticking to his guns with regards to his policy direction. Um, CNG, so, so to just put it very simply, the options are not either take petrol at 1,000 or take CNG at 200, uh, that is a lie. Because CNG is not available at 200, uh, that is a fact of our situation today. You can't get CNG um, uh, uh, freely and readily across the country as we speak. The infrastructure does not exist. We have one or two stations here and there. I don't think across the entire country we have up to 20 CNG stations. Um, um, and then there's also the issue of the conversion and the cost of conversion. How many people can afford one, one million naira to convert a saloon car, you know, uh, to CNG? Uh, because you can't just go to a roadside mechanic or a welder to do this, as we are saying with the Edo case. You know, so, so, so first of all, the cars are not equipped to handle this. There are no stations to dispense the CNG, and you say the option is 1,000 or 200 naira for petrol or CNG, respectively. It's a lie. Um, your options are 1,000 naira for petrol. It's not 1,000 naira, by the way. It's 1,200. That 200 naira it makes a big difference to, be, to, to a lot of people. You get the person that doesn't know. Um, so the options are either 1,200 naira, 1,150 naira, 1,050 naira, the NBC, you know, and, and, and other stations like that. Or park your car and go, or park your generator and don't do anything. Those are the options because electricity is not even an alternative either, anyway, for powering your house. So it's really unfortunate that the president continues to speak like this. Um, on the matter that is affecting the poorest of the poor, impoverishing people for that, um, um, operizing those that were just managing to be in the middle class, many of them have dropped below the middle class bracket into low income bracket because their disposable income has been completely, and you know, watch the way their purchasing power is gone. That is the reality, and, and for the president to flippantly say, you know, you can choose between 1,000 for petrol and 200 for, for a CNG that is not even available, it does show that uh, we're in for a very long <laughs> The guy is not going to back down, um, and it's really up to us as other people to, um, you know, just resist this. Um, if we continue to take it lying low as we have been doing, then you can see why he's speaking with so much confidence. He knows that he's going to get away with it, that nothing's going to happen. And it's very unfortunate. Okay. Well, I just needed to have your take on that because it's been an issue. A lot of people are saying that it's really an arrogant statement, even though uh, the things that he said, even if they were right, but uh, the way he put it was something else. And that's what we've been always saying about public office holders being mindful of what, mindful of what they say. Uh, it seems as if they just take the people for granted. I can say anything and everybody will interpret it the way I want it to be interpreted, and that's not very good for us. 
But let's go back to the IMF issue that we're talking about. The IMF is expressing concern about the level of uh, debt now that is going on. It will exceed a lot of trillions in the coming years. And Nigeria has a significant chunk of this borrowing from that. In fact, IMF has said that Nigeria should put a lead to some kind of borrowing. But on the other hand, they're telling us to do some policies uh, that will make us get so much money. And I don't know how, how that is. So what is your take on the advice of IMF uh, to Nigerians uh, regarding how to get revenue, how to, uh, what kind of policies that Nigeria needs to arrive at the Eldorado, the financial Eldorado that they need, and all that? Well, it's, it's interesting that the IMF is putting out these numbers. Um, uh, I, I must commend them. You know, it, it, it must take um, a certain level of hypocrisy, and um, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is that I want to use now. Um, you know, to 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 bear basically uh, with a straight face, uh, uh, raise alarms about problem that you are right at the heart of. You know, um, the problem that um, you help create. You know, the better more the institutions between the IMF and the World Bank, uh, it would appear as though uh, one of their primary chapters is to indebt the world, <laughs> is to create um, debt situations, uh, of course, especially the developing world, um, and to ensure that we stay in, in those debt situations. Um, so for them to now come out and say oh, the, the world is suffering a global debt crisis, you know, we've got to put a lead on it. I think it's 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 great coming from them, seeing that they are part of the problem. Um, having said that, uh, they are right. <laughs> um, we do have to look at you know the debt problem, uh, you know, across the globe. On the one hand, and in Africa, on the other hand, and particularly in Nigeria, uh, with a view to seeing you know, what can be done about it. From the global perspective, uh, we don't be too worried. And I, and I wonder why the MF is, 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 is worried. Uh, because um, debt in itself and of itself is not a problem. Has never been, will never be. Um, the question around debt is what you do with it um, and how you can pay it off. So if you are borrowing money uh, to, to to fund productive activities, commercial activities, if the debt is self-sustaining, then it shouldn't be a problem. Either directly, either because it's funding projects, you know, and things that directly pay it off, or because it's funding things that will create uh, the, the environment and the world without, or the governments across the world to generate enough income and revenue to pay the debt off. You know, then debt is not a problem. If, however, the case is in most of the developing world, not just Nigeria, if however the debt is taken and either wasted, um, and misappropriated, squandered, mismanaged, or outrightly stolen, then it is a big problem. Because what will then happen is that the debt exists, it's been created, but the commensurate development, the commensurate income that it should have driven is not there, and therefore the ability to pay back you know, it's hampered significantly, and that's, that's been the story for, for Africa. So, um, if you look at countries like Japan, debt to GDP ratio, um, we're talking 255%, 260%, you know, uh, as we speak now. Uh, countries like the United States have well over 100% debt to GDP ratio. Um, the United States, by the way, accounts for 35% of global debt. <laughs> so, of that 100 trillion dollar debt, the United States owns 33 trillion, and they owe it to countries like, you know, China, Japan, and other countries across the world. Um, however, the United States also happens to be the largest economy in the world. You know, um, trillions and trillions of dollars, as, you know, nominal GDP. So, so, and if you look at their revenue to GDP ratio, it's also very robust and very healthy, trending somewhere around 30 percent. So the debt, the debt is not a problem per se. It, it is a problem, especially from the local, from the local economic management perspective. Um, the impact of that debt servicing obligation 
on governmental revenues, on the fiscal structure of the economy, you know, all of that, it is a problem, but it's not a crisis. You know, so it will, it will always be something that the uh, successful government will talk about, it will be a talking point in political campaigns, you know, all of that, but it's not a crisis situation the way it is for us um, in the developing world. So, where that is right, uh, debt should be capped. So the question is, what are the things that we can do? And I think that perhaps that's, that's what the IMF also needs to um, address as they raise these issues. Yeah, but uh, their the influence on the kind of policies that we have in Nigeria is uh, something huge. And uh, so now if they're coming to say Nigeria is still borrowing, that was the, 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 um, the alarm they raised. Uh, yesterday it was on the papers, Nigeria is still borrowing amid high debt costs. Uh, that's uh, IMF now talking. And IMS, F, uh, IMF has also said that all the policies that we have put in place should not be reversed no matter how it is because that's the way to go and all that so i don't know how to reconcile this two on the one hand you're telling us that the stringent policies that are making nigerians to suffer are good enough for our, our economic and financial state and then you're telling us that we should stop borrowing or you're warning us that we are still borrowing amid high uh, debt profile and all that i don't know how to reconcile both do we do we attach ourselves wholeheartedly to the advice and um, policy direction that the IMF is giving us or sh we should craft something for our own and see how we can forge ahead? Um, look, the, the, I think South Korean concern, this is my personal view and I hold on to it very strongly. Nigeria must move away from following the templates of this multilateral financial institutions. These institutions were established to further the interests of the West in particular. Not, not just the developed economies, but of the West in particular. So the United States, the EU, and their allies. These institutions were put together in the aftermath of the World War, Second World War, uh, to help the reconstruction efforts you know, in Germany and all of that. And then over the years, um, their, their mandate has expanded uh, to trying to supposedly help um, the, the modern world uh, develop, but they've done pretty much exactly the opposite. Um, they have foisted on us um, in Nigeria and in other countries, even in Africa and the developing world, policies that cannot work given our local peculiarities. Uh, and that, for me, is the problem with the IMF. So, for me, Nigeria must move away. We must stop listening to these guys. They are not there for us. They're furthering the self-interest, the interests of the paymasters, not our interests. They are not interested in seeing Nigeria develop. They don't want Nigeria to unleash and fulfill its potential, because it will do. If Nigeria, by any means, by any chance, by any stroke of luck, by some circumstance, manages to become what it wants to be, what it can be, given the incredible endowment of resources that we have, uh, you know, available to us, natural resources and human resources combined. It's an unusual connection. Um, only country like the United States, China, um, maybe India, and a few others have this combination of a wealth of human and natural resources. In Africa, we are the Indians. If Nigeria fulfill that potential, we are going to give the United States of America a run for their money. We are going to give Russia a run for its money. We will give the EU combined a run for their money in terms of becoming a competitive player on the global stage. And the IMF don't want this. The United States does not want this. They don't want an extra policy to compete with China. It's a regular problem for them. It's a big problem for them. It's, it's enough. Russia is a problem for them. It's enough. They don't want somebody in Africa you know, to suddenly arise and, and begin to compete with them um, in, in the global competitive competition landscape. Let's not forget that resources are not limitless globally. It's always, there's always a competition for those same resources, whether they be material, whether they be financial, whether they be natural, right? So they don't want us to succeed. So I don't understand why anybody would think that the, the thing to do um, when you need help is to go to the man if you get the help, you will trouble the most. It, it, it makes no sense. It's illogical. 
we need to move away from the IMF and the World Bank and find our own local formulas that will work. And that's why, you know, when we say, uh, I, I understand what they're saying, but I know that they're not coming from the right place. Motives are everything when it comes to certain matters in life. So, yes, we have a debt problem, and our government should not be borrowing more, especially given that they have followed the IMF templates. And I think that's why the IMF is saying what they're saying. I don't necessarily disagree with that particular statement, just looking at it, you know, in that micro sense, sense of it, that you are taking something in the way. You have devalued your currency. Both actions have significantly boosted government revenues. Why are we still borrowing? Why do we open the, the pages of the newspapers and pretty much every week, and you are going to find some new loan that has been approved, $500 million, you know, $1 billion, $3 billion. They fly around in the paper on the regular, where our governments are getting new loans every day. And yet, our revenues have significantly been bumped up, both at the federal level and at the subnational level. So we shouldn't be borrowing, having taken subsidies out. The, the two should not be existing concurrently. Um, we're priding ourselves with the fact that as a result of a subsidy removal, our uh, debt service obligation uh, as a percentage of revenues, total government revenues, dropped from over 100% at some point last year to now, at some point this year, 65%. It's finally now some 5% now. That's a good thing. Um, however, what is the, why, why are we still having to borrow? Because if, if that has gone down and you are adding to the debt, you know, the debt pile that you've got, then it's going to go up again unless revenues also increase. So, so, so I do agree with the IMF that there's a problem with us having to borrow so much more given, given the, the reforms that this government has impacted upon. Uh, but I, I, I don't talk them, I don't know their reasons, I don't talk their motives, and I will not take their prescriptions. I would rather say, We've got incredibly brilliant minds in this country on, in any field of human endeavor. We do not need the INF. I don't understand why somebody from the World Bank would come into Nigeria and come and give some speech about economic management when he doesn't even live in Nigeria. He doesn't understand that local government is done or he doesn't understand the interplay between culture, religion, and the economy. You know, he didn't understand these things. How can they be the ones telling us what we should be doing? We've got more than enough brilliant minds to, to craft our own local answers to our local problems. We don't need the IMF. We don't need the World Bank. Okay. Uh, we hope that our people will look at the fact that we have uh, very brilliant minds, as you have said. We still know that we are battling with the IPPIS and all those ones where uh, the tertiary institutions um, came up with a framework of payment that was, according to them, good enough and better than what the national, the, uh, the federal government was giving to them, and they still did not respect it. We've seen solutions being brought by our our uh, brilliant minds, as you, have, as you have said, and they've been jettisoned for foreign policies or foreign uh, solutions to problems that are domestic and are local. But we do hope that we'll get to that point where we respect our own and know that we can find local solutions to our problems. But right now, this is where we'll have to drop it. We'd like to thank you, Mr. Shokwiton, for coming on the show. Thanks for having me. Have a good day. You too. We've been talking to Mr. Sherwin Shopwiton, the Chairman Accountability Condor and Transparency Network. We were looking at the statement of IMF that there's too much borrowing and uh, there was some kind of warning that there's the countries, especially the third world countries or developing countries, should put a lead to it. Okay, so that's how we are wrapping up on the show this morning. We'd like to thank you for being a part of the show and hope that you can join us tomorrow for another edition of the show. In the meantime, on behalf of the entire uh, Breakfast family, my name is Nyam Gul Agaji saying thank you for being there. <laughs>